welcome to our teleclinic tonight on cholesterol, a subject that we have heard a lot about and that there seems to still be quite a bit of controversy. Cholesterol is an important part of the cell membrane of all the tissues of our body. Actually, the organs that are most metabolically active, including the prostate in men and testes, and the adrenal glands in women as well, and the thymus, and the lung, and the heart, and in the fetal heart, we find that cholesterol is concentrated and absolutely essential for life. The cell membrane requires cholesterol as a gate mechanism to control the inflow of nutrients and the excretion of waste products under the influence of all the other hormones of the body. So cholesterol is the starting material for all of the most beneficial hormones that we have to deal with, and we're going to talk about that tonight. Cholesterol is the basic structure of hormones such as progesterone, estrogen, and testosterone, and as well, it has a lot to do with even the formation of things like vitamin D. But the problem is we are bombarded by, by compounds called xenoestrogens, such as a birth control hormone, 17 beta estradiol, and some of the chemicals that we are familiar with, the bisphenol A's, the uh, dieldrin, which is a, a crop a pesticide, and these compounds get involved in the metabolism of cholesterol and the production of the hormones that are so vital for our life. Let's discuss cholesterol as a very important component of the way our body handles free radicals. And we're going to talk about the chemical free radicals as being the dirt, the accumulation that occurs in cells as the cell ages and as the cell is bombarded by chemicals from the outside environment. And let's talk about the liver as being the bucket the LDL cholesterol being the water that's supposed to be in the bucket, and then the dirty water as an oxidized form of LDL cholesterol, and then the sponge as being HDL. Now, if we think of it in this manner, we see that there's a job that has to be done, and that is to clean up the dirt, get it to the bucket so that the bucket can excrete the waste product, clean the sponge, and send it back out into the environment with the with the clean water in order to keep the, the cells clean from free radicals. Now this process goes on continuously before birth in our in the, um, the fetus and through every cell of our body as we age. The oxidized bad LDL cholesterol is kind of like what we call skid marks. After the injury has occurred we see LDL cholesterol occur and this is uh, this indicates that there's been more free radicals accumulate than our body is able to get rid of. High LDL suggests the body is chemically overloaded and out of control. So when you get a blood profile, you want to look at the LDL cholesterol and uh, identify it as being either, <laughs> either accumulating in high levels or it's most likely formed from high amounts of oxidized LDL cholesterol, the dirty water in other words. So the LDL does not cause a disease, it is the result of whatever is going on, and most of the time that is due to a lack of antioxidants and free radical accumulation, as we have already discussed. LDL oxidizes kind of like a, uh, an apple that's exposed to air. It's going to change its configuration, and it creates what's called a chain reaction so that the oxygenated and partially oxidized form of LDL is very sticky and it is ac accumulative and will plug up the arteries. This chain reaction occurs very quickly and it can bring about a rapid increase in oxidized stress. We've had people that have had tests and their arteries were clear completely from ultrasound scans and x-rays and in five years they go from having no accumulation of oxidized cholesterol plaque into the formation of heavy amounts in their carotid artery and in their coronary arteries as well. So this is something that uh, we often think of as being a chronic, slow developing process, but in reality, changes in lifestyle and stress can have a dramatic effect 
on the oxidation of this cholesterol. The good cholesterol comes to the rescue and grabs on to the bad LDL, the oxidized LDL cholesterol, and transports it back to the liver where the liver can break it down and return the LDL back into circulation as, uh, as in the reduced form. This is a process that goes on continuously. When we have more LDL than we can than we can manage in our body, our body tries to get rid of it by sending it out through bile salts, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> the Framingham study on heart disease began in 1947 when they first discovered that there was cholesterol found in coronary artery occlusion. And so they began monitoring in the little uh, town of Framingham, Massachusetts, the, the death rate of people and the level of their cholesterol, both the total LDL and HDL. But in 1991, a very amazing thing happened. They found out that cholesterol did not correlate with heart disease as they expected. And instead they added on blood pressure if the person was diabetic and if they were a smoker to this study. And of course that connection made more sense than just looking at cholesterol. Research has shown that longevity has to do with a number of factors, one of which is the ability to have antioxidants available to the body upon demand. And we see that mice, which have a low serum cholesterol, live only a few years. Cows live about 20 years. Great apes live almost 50. And humans are approaching 100 years of age. And the reason why was actually explained back in 1993 in a journal of lipid research, which, by the way, Shackley uses as published in many of their studies, on the role of the liver in maintaining cholesterol and what we call the low-density lipoprotein balance. So what we conclude is that humans produce HDL cholesterol as an antioxidant that reduces oxygen damage in cell membranes and blood vessels. So if you do not get enough antioxidants in your diet, guess what your body does? It increases the production of cholesterol. And so cholesterol levels are a response to the environment and to our diet and to oxidative stress. As a result, I found my patients from the northern climates all the way from uh, Yukon and Alaska and across Canada have generally higher cholesterol levels than those people who are native to Arizona and Florida and the southern states, especially those around the equator. And the reason for that is the environment. The environment is much more hostile and during the winter in those climates, and we see the cholesterol levels go up as a result. This is a study that was published in the uh, Psychiatry and Clinical Neurosciences back in 2010 that showed that while we know that heart disease can be associated with cholesterol high levels, what about the low cholesterol? And they found out that people who have low cholesterol have a higher incidence of depression, aggression, suicide, cancer, and stroke. And so they're saying maybe we should take a closer look at t having people reduce their cholesterol level synthetically or haphazardly just because the number appears to be too high. And in actuality, that is the case. Because when we look more carefully at research, and this was in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society in 2005, they looked at a group of New Yorkers that were in their late 70s and approaching the age of 80, and they found out that those people who had the lowest cholesterol, the 25% in the lowest cholesterol, had a shorter life expectancy. They were twice as likely to die than those people who had a higher cholesterol level. So cholesterol by itself is not an indicator of longevity. It's an inverse indicator. The better your cholesterol level, the lower your risk of dying within the next few years. Now, I know this isn't what you read in the public news, but that brings up a very interesting point. That the Framingham study in 1996 published the fact that 50% of the people who have coronary heart disease are actually those who have a below average 
cholesterol level. So it is exactly balanced between the good and the bad. In other words, it has nothing to do with cholesterol by, by itself. And yet we have had a battle against cholesterol for decades, but the research does not show that. Stress seems to have a great effect on cholesterol. And if you're trying to focus on this uh, eye chart, you won't be able to because I've pulled a little trick on you. And, and it will, if you watch this before very long, your heart rate will go up, your, your blood pressure will go up, and guess what? Your production of cholesterol will go up because any incidence of stress that continues for very long, even though it's a low-level stress, is going to have an effect on the adrenal glands, which promotes the production of cholesterol because we use cholesterol to manufacture one of the most important anti-stress hormones known, and that is cortisol. And cortisol is an indicator of stress in, and the ability of us to handle our stress. Here's a study that was done in 2015, or 2012, excuse me, correlating adrenal stress with increased circulating cortisol. And we've heard about the effect of cortisol on people with overweight. People who have mid-body obesity are actually more likely to have high cortisol levels as a result of high stress on, by the adrenal glands. When the adrenal glands suspect stress, they're going to stimulate the production of cortisol. This actually carries over and makes sense to us because a type A behavior person is, uh, is more likely to have elevated cholesterol due to their higher lifestyle. And, you know, type A behavior doesn't mean it's all bad stress. And I tell my patients that a tickle is fun for the first half second. And then after that, it is a full-blown stress on the body if we continue to be tickled. When my granddaughter was just uh, six years old, I actually was tickling her and she looked me in the eye and says, Grandpa, I'm not a toy. I want to be your friend. <laughs> so we have to be careful about how we, how we even think about stress and how it can produce it because it does produce cholesterol and it does crank it because the demand for cortisol is high. Our body has to make more cholesterol in order to handle that. Stress relief complex with ashwagandha has been clinically shown to reduce cortisol production after the stress has been reduced. Now, we use it even as an anti-stress uh, substance, especially for women who have small children, women who are work out of the home and have many responsibilities. Stress relief is wonderful to help control cortisol. And of course, in the long run, this helps to keep down the production of cholesterol as well. I want you to think about this for a moment. You saw the structures of cholesterol and how it's related to the sex hormones and to cortisol. Cholesterol is an expensive molecule to make. It is a complicated molecule. It is not synthetically made without a great deal of effort in the laboratory. And the body goes through tremendous stress to make cholesterol. So it doesn't want to make excess cholesterol, excess cholesterol if it doesn't have to. It's only when our demand is high for these hormones to try and help us cope with stress that we see cortisol levels go up and cholesterol go up to maintain them. So Shackley Stress Relief Complex has a dramatic effect on people who have high stress and preventing this accumulation of excessive cortisol. Exercise is a wonderful way to control stress because it produces a group of neurophysiological hormones, particularly the slow release of adrenaline, which allows us to adapt to stress. You see, Exercise, when you get up in the morning and go to the gym and you work out, you are having planned physical stress. You're saying, I'm going to work out on the elliptical machine, the weights, the aerobic class uh, for a half hour or an hour and a half, whatever it may be. You are planning your stress. No one has suddenly dropped in on you and induced stress. Uh, you have created a safe environment to experience stress and you learn to adapt to it. That's what exercise is all about. And that's why many exercise physiologists have said just moderate exercise has a tremendous effect on lowering cholesterol. 
and there's nothing that works more quickly than exercise to bring down that, a, that LDL cholesterol. And it raises HDL as well. The omega-3s, there's been a lot of research on omega-3 fatty acids and how the body uses those in order to lower the production of not only cholesterol, but triglycerides as well. And we should say that the LDL cholesterol that we talk about is a lipoprotein that is almost 50% triglyceride. Triglycerides are water insoluble. They are fats. They float in our bloodstream and they can actually be very, very damaging to uh, and vulnerable to oxidative stress. So being able to have adequate omega-3 levels not only will help to keep your your vitamin or your nutrient levels adequate and your cholesterol low, but it also lowers C-reactive protein. And it is the only class of nutrients that has been observed to lower C-reactive protein. Some of you may recall that this is a direct correlation of coronary heart disease, much better than cholesterol. So C-reactive protein was part of the early Shackley landmark study that showed that Shackley users have lower C-reactive protein overall than the general public or those people who use brand other brands of, of products. Omega guard is essential. Human beings need to take supplemental omega-3 fatty acids and the uh, EPA and DHA, those two seem to be the most pronounced in their ability to help prevent the accumulation of, uh, of LDL cholesterol. So we need it, and uh, any if your total cholesterol is below 250, you can take 1,000 milligrams of BPA, that's about three tablets a day, and it will drop at 25%, and it will get the LDL down, and that's what you wanna do. Fiber, fiber has been known to help reduce cholesterol, and um, Quaker Oats talks about their great effect on lowering cholesterol, yet it only lowers at about five to 10%. Um, soluble and insoluble fibers combined are able to reduce cholesterol by another 15 to 25 percent. If you're not getting enough fiber in your diet, you are going to have a difficult time getting your LDL cholesterol down because it is the carrier of the waste LDL cholesterol out of the body through the gallbladder and through the stool. Shackley Fiber Advantage Bar is the only product we have that contains what's called resistant starch. And it is a special kind of fiber that helps to absorb and hold on to LDL cholesterol and carry it out of the body. So it's extremely important that we get an adequate amount of fiber and one of the fiber advantage bars per day has the effect of probably eating a whole loaf of whole wheat bread without all the calories. It's extremely beneficial. So either eat your half a cup of broccoli, a half cup of oatmeal, a whole apple, and a half cup of carrots every day, or take the Shackley Fiber Advantage Bar. And I find the Advantage Bar to be a great addition to people who want to lower their LDL cholesterol. What about the cholesterol reduction complex? Now, this is based upon the early research of plant sterols and stanols. And these were used actually in the early uh, statin research, looking at Lipitor and comparing a good diet, which they found uh, when, has enough, when it has enough of the sterols and stanols will actually lower cholesterol by itself. And Shackley Cholesterol Reduction Complex has been named because the FDA allows that name because of the research that stands behind sterols and stanols that have been done. These are naturally safe supplements that do not interfere with other medications and can even be used with statin drugs. Although we have many patients that have gotten totally off of their statin drugs, when they explain to their doctor that they want to use the Shackley cholesterol reduction complex, they want to do moderate exercise, they want to eat a good healthy diet, take the omega-3s, take the stress relief, get some exercise, do all the things we're talking about. And many of the doctors that uh, forgot about the original sterols and stanol studies real recognize when people get better when using the cholesterol reduction 
that it is it actually has more research behind it than the sterols and scanol. It's been studied longer than the ster than the statin drugs. What about soy? There is so much controversy about this. I get asked more questions about soy than we've ever, ever dreamed of. And in reality, the studies have been proven over and over again that healthy, raw or fermented or cold water washed soy has a tremendous advantage of reducing cholesterol. It is actually the only plant um, substance by itself that provides cholesterol reduction capabilities. So getting 30 to 50 grams a day, that's three to five tablespoons of the Shackley protein, any of the soy proteins, has a tremendous effect on lowering cholesterol. This is a study, a landmark study, that looked at vitamin D3. And um, as you remember, the landmark two study was a study done to investigate a problem called metabolic syndrome. And this is a combination of coronary heart disease risks, including uh, overweight, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and high blood sugar. And many people were seeing five different doctors for those conditions, and they were on five to 12 drugs to try and control each of those conditions. Shackley found out from their studies and published this, the data that showed that like, Vitamin D3 alone, exclusive of any other therapies, had a lowering effect <clears throat> on uh, the metabolic syndrome. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to have a little soy protein drink. And so we call this the Landmark 2 study because it definitely showed the place for vitamin D3 in the prevention of coronary heart disease by reducing the uh, presence of metabolic syndrome X. This was a fantastic research study that many of us uh, appreciate and many of us use in our, our daily practice to show people that a single nutrient deficiency across the board has multiple benefits. <coughs> now, this is a study that was done on the beyond the cholesterol lowering effect of soy helping the cardiovascular system and to prevent heart disease. And this study showed that there are at least 12 benefits of soy protein that we do not get with whey protein or with non-soy protein that helps cardiovascular effects. 2017 showed that there are at least 12 benefits being antihypertensive, antiglycemic, anti-inflammatory, as well as other indicators showing that a soy protein diet has a tremendous effect on the long-term heart uh, prevention of heart disease and the lowering of cholesterol. So many people ask me, do I, do I recommend Shackley soy protein? And I say, absolutely, I take it myself at least once and many times, like three times a day, including today, it's been a long one. Vitamin D and hypercholesterolemia, the general studies in the Spanish general population. This was published in 2013 in the Dermatological Endocrinology Journal. And it showed that blood levels of vitamin D3 triggers increased production of cholesterol. So if you have low vitamin D3, you are going to crank up your cholesterol production. So why not manage your vitamin D3 level instead of trying to manage your cholesterol? And I find that this to be much more effective than trying to tell people to stay away from eggs and dairy and red meat and other things. Why don't you get your vitamin D level up where it belongs first and see what your body does genetically with the D3? <clears throat> Published back in New York, uh, New York Times, vitamin D may lower cholesterol, they say. Well, dosages from 1,000 to 8,000 international units per day resulted in progressive better LDL levels in a population of uh, over well, 576 postmenopausal women. And I think that's probably the best study that's ever been done. Uh, on, on the benefit of vitamin D. So how much do you need? <clears throat> well, it depends on your absorption. It depends on your stress level. It depends on your genetics. It depends on the, the availability of your vitamin D receptors 
that are present in the, the genetics, the chromosomes on your cell, in your cell. And so you may need uh, um, 1,000 international units a day, or you may need as high as 8,000 in order to get the benefit. Now, you want to do that to get your blood levels up into the therapeutic range, which is above 60 nanograms per milliliter, or for you Canadians, above 150 nanomoles per liter, okay? You want to get your vitamin D level up and keep it there because genetically, we are designed to be live in the sunshine and not, not to be over exposed to sun where we burn and we get damaged, but to get small amounts and to be able to keep our vitamin D level up. And I would say any of us who live north of Miami are going to have low vitamin D levels sometime during the year unless you supplement. There is just no way we can maintain our vitamin D levels without supplementation. <clears throat> what about the people in the medical community that question all this thing about the cholesterol. Now, you hear me talking about it, and it sounds like I'm downplaying the cholesterol issue. And in reality, I'm not alone, because there are a number of doctors uh, who are cardiologists and in the field of medical pathology who say cholesterol is really nothing to fear, but it's something to look very carefully at the cause of why it is there. And so we see... <clears throat> particularly the former director of the Cardiovascular Research Center, Dr. Rav Noskov, who wrote a book called The Cholesterol Myths, exposing the fallacy that it's saturated fat and cholesterol are the cause of heart disease. And Michael Gurr, a renowned lipid biochemist, also supported it and said he's not alone, a voice in the wilderness, and he deserves to be taken seriously. And his point is that cholesterol shouldn't be, quote, reduced, but it should be managed and it should be looked at. And we should look at the different, uh, the different types of cholesterol that we have before we just jump in and try to lower it by itself. The, the theory versus facts. We've been told that high fat foods cause heart disease. The effects are it does not. Cholesterol protects against infections and atherosclerosis when it's the right kind. High fat foods raise blood cholesterol. That's been shown to not be true. That people who have extremely high fat diets, some of the, the uh, native peoples in Africa and in the far north live on a 50 to 60% fat diet. 50 to 60% of their calories are fat and they have extremely low cholesterol. And I have found even in my vegetarian patients that by holding off on cholesterol, they will actually convert uh, carbohydrates into cholesterol. People ask me, why do I have high cholesterol when I'm a vegetarian? And I say, cows are vegetarians. They eat only plant material. And if you feed them corn and wheat and grains, you're going to produce cholesterol. And that's what happens in humans as well. The statement that cholesterol blocks arteries is not true. The vitamin D and vitamin K2 research shows that uh, if your level, adequate levels of vitamin D3 and vitamin K2 are present, you will not have calcification and coronary heart disease. Animal studies prove heart diet. New York Times, what if, all, if we've all been a big fat lie? They say all the studies were done on rabbits, where rabbits were force-fed cholesterol foods, uh, and you don't, you don't see a, a rabbit eating cholesterol foods. They just don't. So you can force feed them and you can produce things that are abnormal to their diet. Lowering cholesterol will lengthen your life. Well, I showed you the New York study, the geriatric study that showed that is not true. If you're in your 70s, you do not want your cholesterol to go low. That is actually a cardinal sign that you're losing the ability to make the adaptogenic hormones and manage your overall health. Polyunsaturated oils are good for you, we've been told. Well, Cellier pointed out that the sensitization by corn oil for the production of cardiac necrosis, you will get heart disease from eating polyunsaturated oils like corn oil, safflower, sunflower seed oil, even soybean oil all by itself will cause more damage than it really prevents. We were put on the margarine thing back in the 1960s thinking it would increase heart, uh, reduce heart disease, when in actuality all it did was raise cancer risk because of the damage. 
The cholesterol campaign is based on good, honest science. Well, the International Network of Cholesterol Skeptics says otherwise, and you can go to their website and take a look at it. But these controversies have been going on for a long time, and there are still people that hold on to the old belief that cholesterol is the, the problem, and in reality, it is the innocent bystander who gets blamed for it. It is like the <clears throat> skid marks uh, at the sign of the uh, at the scene of the accident. It wasn't their fault, but they leave the evidence. So what about statins? <clears throat> well, where did they come from? You can go to the Journal of Atherosclerosis Supplementation, and you can read that that statins were first discovered following the Korean War, where they were used by the North Koreans as a biological weapon against their South Korean enemies. That's where Eli Lilly picked up the concept that it would lower cholesterol, which in actuality it does. It is a poison that literally destroys the enzyme system in the liver, the mevalonic acid pathway that makes cholesterol. After five years, 90% of the people who, who use statin drugs will notice some of the following, rashes, diarrhea, dizziness, headaches, drowsiness, constipation, gas, bloating, skin flushing, nausea, vomiting, difficulty sleeping, abdominal cramping and pain, muscle tenderness and weakness in their extremities, which is related to neuropathy. Why is this true? Well, one of the reasons is because <clears throat> the drug itself has been mislabeled or people don't read this fine print. This is a TV ad in 2006 on Crestor, and at the very bottom of it, they make a statement, Crestor has not been shown to prevent heart disease or heart attacks. People don't read the fine print. So if you say, I've been on your drugs and it didn't help, they say, well, we never promised you it would. <laughs> it will lower your cholesterol. That's all we can tell you. It will not improve your risk of heart disease or extend your life. Lipitor has not been shown to prevent or heart disease or heart attacks. The U.S. TV ad, over $30 million was, uh, was paid out by the advertising agency, and there have been no proven benefits whatsoever. So if a person is on Lipitor, Zocor, Crestor, any of the statins to lower cholesterol artificially, the studies do not support that it extends the quality or the length of life, and it does not prevent heart disease. Why do I say that is true? <clears throat> Well, the studies, again, this is a study that was done, the, the ASCOT study. You can look this up, looking at Lipitor's mortality, and this was across multi-generations of people across Europe and the U.S. It was published in The Lancet in April 5th of 2003, and it showed that people who were on statins had a higher risk than people who took the placebo. And I'm not going to go through and read all the bad things about it, but the reason is, the main reason that statins are bad for you is that they deplete coenzyme Q10 in the body. And coenzyme Q10, as we know, has uh, been called the major cardiovascular preventive nutrient. It is recycled. It is an antioxidant that helps in the manage of, of energy production within the mitochondria of the, of the cells of the body. And so if you're depleting coenzyme 10, then you're actually taking a drug to prevent the disease, which actually is causing a foundational cause of the disease. You are now, Eli Lilly, when they, when they discovered this, tried to go to the FDA and get an upgrade on their patent for Lipitor and get coenzyme Q10 added to the drug, and the FDA turned them down because coenzyme Q10 is a natural substance that cannot be patented. So most doctors, when they put people on statin drugs who are aware of the mechanism, the biochemistry of this, will tell their patients, you should be taking some coenzyme Q10. <laughs> That's a nice thing to say because you're taking a poison which is going to deplete your coenzyme Q10. So I, I tell people the science actually is in favor of using more natural means and looking at the cause of cholesterol. Okay, uh, the important information that's packed along with the drug is Lipitor, which is called 
Atorvastatin calcium is a prescription drug used with diet to lower cholesterol. Lipitor is not for everyone, including those with liver disease or possibly liver problems for women who are nursing, pregnant, or may become pregnant. Lipitor has not been shown to prevent heart disease or heart attacks. That's in the fine print of the drug. Why would you take a drug that has not been shown to prevent heart disease but will lower your cholesterol because it has a poisoning effect on the body? Well, it comes down to false advertising. And this is where the, um, <clears throat> where the Congress got involved. And uh, in February of 2008, one of the main proponents of statin drugs, which was hired by Lipitor, was um, Dr. Jarvik. And Dr. Jarvik had never practiced a day in his life. He has his medical degree, but actually was a spokesperson who was paid $1.3 million for his ads, which said that statins are beneficial and I take them every day. And he was actually in a scene where he was rowing a, a, a skull boat. And one of his buddies later said, that's really strange because I've never seen him do any physical work whatsoever. So that was amazing. But... The Times picked this story up, and uh, Good Morning America even discussed it, and said it was an educational campaign, and there was no science behind it whatsoever. And so the, um, the congressional record actually looked into this, and they found out that, uh, that Fitzer was actually fined for their false advertising. In, fine, in closing, I just want to point out that tissue cholesterol levels are vital for health. You've got to have some. No one has zero cholesterol and lives. As a matter of fact, even people have levels that go below 150 from the curve we showed, the health versus disease curve. When you get below 150, you're starting to get in the danger zone of being too low. And if you get over 250, you're in the danger zone of being too high. And you need to know the cause. You need to look at the cause of this and not just simply jump on it and blame the cholesterol as the cause of it. Blood lipoprotein cholesterols are a predictive marker of health or disease. They're not the cause. They indicate there's a stress going on and you need to deal with it. Drug suppression of cholesterol synthesis by the statins does not extend life expectancy, nor does it reduce heart attack risk. Drugs such as statins will be the next thalamide disaster, and it's already started because many doctors are downplaying the statins. Genetic expression for regulating cholesterol metabolism is driven by diet and external stress. Vitamin D3 and other fat-soluble nutrients in the blood are the best protector and greatest predictor of cardio disease, cardiovascular disease, not cholesterol. And one of the newest ones is the research on vitamin K2. And you might want to go to my website, sunnysidehealthcenter.com, and look at the research on, uh, on vitamin K2 as being the nutrient that helps to prevent cholesterol, uh, calcium from going into soft tissue and putting it back into the bone. So women with osteoporosis and, uh, and men and women who have uh, calcification of their coronary arteries or their carotid artery or any arteries should be looking at their vitamin K2 status. Now, there are no good tests for vitamin K2 right now other than a measurement of what is called the uncarboxylated olecalcin. Olecalcin is a hormone that has to do with where calcium gets put, either in the bone or in soft tissue where there is damage. And Vitamin K2 seems to help that. <clears throat> so we're going to.